geometry's relationship to four potentials may just end up giving us a unified field theory for gravity and electromagnetism. This graphic hopefully explains the core idea. Newton's theory of gravity is a potential theory working on a completely square, flat background. Einstein's theory for gravity ignores potentials entirely, focusing instead on curving the graph paper. My work is trying to find a compromise between these two. The three theories for gravity that are the simplest would start with Newton's theory, which is a potential theory and classified as a rank zero field theory. Einstein's proposal is a metric theory. It is rank two. And in between rank zero and rank two is my proposal, which I call GEM for gravity and electromagnetism. It can be about the potential, or the metric, or any combination of the two. It is a rank one field theory. We need to work with tensors, which are tools for both geometry and potentials. Here is the four potential, which can be written in any coordinate system one wants to work with. We want to study change, and so we work with the four derivative, which again will work in any coordinate system. But you cannot simply take the four derivative of a four potential. That does not transform like a tensor. The reason is that as you move around the manifold, the manifold itself might change, and you have to account for that. So to do that, to study changes with tensors, you need to use the covariant derivative. This is geometry in bed with the potential. On the left side of the bed is the four derivative of the four potential. On the right side of the bed is the connection, which is a derivative of a metric written as that capital gamma. There are two extremes in this situation. One is working in flat Euclidean spacetime, where the connection will be zero everywhere. And the other extreme is where it's all about how the manifold gets changed as one moves around, and there are no contributions from the four derivative of the four potential. Physics works in one or the other sort of extremes. If you want to work without geometry, formally there is no connection involved, and focus instead on changes with the potentials, then you would use exterior derivatives. We see this, chain, this subtraction here, and because the connection is symmetric, it will cancel itself out of such an expression. Exterior derivatives are extremely useful. They are used for electromagnetism, for the weak force, and for the strong force. They get combined with different symmetries to do different physics. U1 for light, SU2 for the weak force, and SU3 for the strong force. If you want to work with the opposite situation, where you're working with changes with geometry, and you have really boxed out potentials, then you'd be working with the Riemann curvature tensor. This is a rank four tensor, and here is its standard definition. What is good about this is the derivative of the connection, because the connection is a derivative of a metric. So you have the derivative of the derivative of a metric, a second order differential equation, which can be solved 
and once solved gives you a solution that is a dynamic metric. The problem with this is this difference between two derivatives of connections because it is possible that it will be zero somewhere on that manifold. And where it is zero, its energy is zero. Now you can't make the manifold this difference zero everywhere, but it is possible anywhere. And so if it's zero, the energy is zero, and you will not be able to quantize the theory. And I think that's why more than 70 years of effort to quantize general relativity have failed because of this property of the Riemann curvature tensor. So we want to work with both. We want to work with geometry, be able to see a connection. We want to work with potentials to see the, the, the differential of, uh, of, of four potential. And we can do that with the GEM unified field equations. Show this to a well-trained physicist and he'll think he's looking at the Maxwell equations in the Lorentz gauge. Now that's a good thing because you can do all of electromagnetism with it. There is this extra current in there which I claim is a mass charge for its, no, it's a, it's a four momentum. Um, it's important to think of it as a four momentum. It's not, yeah. Uh, but the, the, uh, one of the problems is this del squared because people think I mean the de Lambertian operator, which is a scalar operator, and then this is only about potentials. But I would have written that as just a box. Instead, this is a two covariant derivatives applied one after the other. And it will look like this when we expand out the terms. What's good about this is this uh, Laplacian of a uh, four potential. It's Newton-like because Newton was worked with just a scalar potential and this is a four potential. And that's important if you want uh, potential theory to explain light bending around the sun uh, because you need more than uh, one potential to explain that. Another good thing is that you have this derivative of a connection. So you have a second order der derivatives of a, a metric and possibly there's a metric solution that is physically relevant. To make the solution more tractable, we will work with uh, uh, trying to have a little bit less geometry. In other words, the connection doesn't play uh, a significant role numerically and study changes with the potential in order to create both Gauss's and Newton's laws. Here is the gem first term, uh, this difference of uh, two charge densities. and if it turns out that the mass density is much, much less than the electric charge density, then we have Gauss's law. That's what will happen for an electron where the electric charge density is 16 orders of magnitude larger than its mass density measured in the same terms. At the the other end, if one is working with a neutral uh, particle, then what we have is something like Newton's law. Now it's Newton-like because there is that second order uh, time derivative. So that's very important because it means change in uh, a mass density will not propagate instantly. As a matter of fact, it says rather explicitly there that it will change at the speed of light c. So this is going to be okay with special relativity. Now let's look at the opposite situation where we have changes with the geometry and we're not going to focus on the potentials because we end up with a differential metric equation. This equation can be solved for a metric and I've done that. 
for a static neutral solution. It is this exponential metric in the literature. It's known as the Rosen metric. This is the interval squared equaling the exponent of minus 2 gm over c squared r. That's a geometric length of, um, of a source mass minus expo the exponential of plus 2 gm over c squared r times dr squared. I think that this exponential metric is really great. It has going well, it is going to pass the tests. It's going to pass tests of the equivalence principle because it is a metric solution. And any sort of mass or energy that you th throw around the universe is going to follow this uh, metric solution, which is what the equivalence principle is really about. It will pass all the weak field tests we've done today. The reason is that if you take the Taylor series of the exponential metric, it is exactly the same as the Taylor series of the Schwarzschild metric of general relativity to the terms that have been tested. It will also pass the strong field tests because this is only about this metric. It's not, there are not multiple fields around when there are multiple fields around, then there's places to store energy and momentum, and you can have a dipole moment. With this theory, the lowest mode for an isolated source, the lowest mode of gravity wave emissions would be a quadrupole, the kind of a water balloon sort of uh, mode of emission. Another a wonderful aspect of this proposal is that you can test it. You can test it and find out whether it is right or wrong based on experimental data alone. For light bending around the sun, it predicts that it will go around, it will be bent 1.75 uh, arc seconds just like general relativity. If you then go and measure a million fold more sensitive, then the GEM theory predicts that light will bend about 20% more, uh, 0 0.8 micro arc seconds. Now, we only can get data on the, to the order of 100 micro arc seconds, so it's going to take a while uh, before we collect this kind of data, but at least it it's makes a very clear t prediction. The polarization of gravity waves will also be different. Now, we haven't detected a gravity wave, and so this is also going to be for the future, particularly since it'll take measurements along six axes to figure out the polarization. But general relativity says the waves will be transverse. In the GEM proposal, the transverse modes of emission are light. And that means that the scalar and longitudinal modes um, could be the spin to gravity, uh, graviton sorts of waves. But I think that this proposal is also manifestly beautiful. Important laws of physics often involve exponentials. Now there's a reason for this. An exponential with a really tall, ex uh, really small um, exponent will essentially be the identity with a little bit of simple harmonic motion. And that's essentially what goes on with gravity. The Earth has been oscillating around the Sun for 4 billion years. I want to oscillate around the center of the Earth along with every other thing that's around me so we actually don't oscillate uh, unless we're giving a little bit of freedom. Quantization for this proposal is going to be easy. It's going to be easy because it's just like Maxwell. Specifically, it is four-dimensional. The vacuum equations are linear. We have a spin one field for the photon, uh, and that's where like charges repel. And there is a spin two field for the graviton, 
where like charges attract. Now, it does break U1 symmetry, but I think that's a good thing because it means that we don't need the Higgs mechanism, we don't need the Higgs particle. It is going to be very difficult to sell because it is uh, for a variety of reasons. But what's good is this derivative of the connection. Everybody works with that. And I have argued that this difference of derivative of connections, the possibility that that could be zero, is bad. But if we think that bad really is wrong, then we are in conflict with a large body of research that goes on as far as gravity is concerned. Because anything that depends on the Riemann curvature tensor, which has this property, would therefore be wrong. And that would include classical general relativity, work numerically, black hole physics, string theory, which spots the Einstein's field equa uh, equations inside it, loop quantum gravity, which actually studies particular solutions um, of Einstein's field uh, equations. And as I say, uh, we might not need the Higgs anymore. So I hope I've given you a sense of what this unified field theory is. There is a simple difference of two currents, one for uh, for electric charge, the other for mass charge. And that box squared is two covariant derivatives applied to a four potential. So we can have Newton's theory as a four potential theory, changes in that four potential theory, or we could look at it as being changes of a connection, which is changes in the changes of a metric, or we could even do some kind of compromise between the two. Thank you very much.